We believe at the Iowa that the story of battleship aviation has never really been told well at all by any of the museums. They haven't been able to collect enough aircraft or enough artifacts or knowledge or, or perhaps even just had a focus. Uh, it actually spans float plane, fixed wing technology from the early 40s, or actually earlier than that, to the 20s really, all the way through the rotary wing aircraft of the Korean War era, uh, through the Cold War in the 80s, where virtually every helicopter that the Navy had could land on the ship. It also includes the remotely piloted vehicles that were launched from the Iowa back in the 80s. We'd like to tell that story. We think it appeals to a younger generation as well. So we're just excited about having aircraft on board the, the ship again. This is an HUP-2, or a, as we call it, a HUP-2. HUP-1 started in the late 40s as a, one of the earliest twin rotor aircraft. Uh, HUP-2 was a slight improvement. It had a slightly larger engine and a, um, an autopilot mechanism, hence the designation change. And there was also a HUP-3 and a HUP-4. These were early uh, carrier or gunship based aircraft. This is the type of helicopter that was one of the first two to operate off the ship. Not this particular helicopter necessarily, but a helicopter of this same design type was the first to operate off the ship. The one that, that's going to the USS Iowa, serial number 82, it's a fairly early aircraft. The one that we have is a much later one and so there are differences. They look similar from the outside, but there are details that are different. I know that the vertical fin on this one is uh, composite, and the vertical fin on yours is metal, is aluminum. If you notice, the hub that we have has covers that flop down to cover this up aerodynamically. On the later models, which this is, they've, uh, they've eliminated that, my guess would be for weight. And then yesterday we were, were here, the aircraft was in the backside of a warehouse. We had to remove it from the building, tow it out. Kind of a challenge given that uh, it weighs almost 4,000 pounds and we had to use a forklift from the, the company here to, to tow it out. Uh, we also had to search through the warehouse for all the pieces and parts. We found six or seven boxes of, of aircraft parts from this particular airship. So we had a lot of just pulling out of things and pieces and recognition that we had to do. It's part of the sheet metal. I think it goes on the bottom near the tail. And who's going to figure out where that stuff really goes? <laughs> I think it's going to be one of us. And then we also have an engine, a spare engine, that is on a stand. And all of it's going to be uh, placed on trucks tomorrow. We have two different trucks coming. A low boy for the aircraft and the engine and the, the, the helicopter blades. Also another closed box van just for the boxes that we can't really close up. So a lot of work here just to get it going. Uh, yesterday was the pull-out day, today is the, the preparation and tie-down day, making sure that nothing is loose on the aircraft. I don't think that's going anywhere. No. And I've got that tied. This is around here and these two are tied together. I don't think that'll do anything. We also spent a lot of time with zip ties, just making sure that the electrical lines and the wires were secured and they wouldn't bounce around during the trip across the country. And then after that, it's really about training the aircraft onto the flatbed. The challenges that we had were really based on uh, regulatory restrictions regarding height and also width. Okay, set her down. We had to center the aircraft perfectly on the flatbed. It barely fit. And then the height was about an inch over the required uh, amount here. So we went ahead and removed the tail wheel, which wasn't all that hard to do, but it took about a half hour of work and um, managed to drop the tail wheel and lower the, the rear of the aircraft down about uh, five or six inches. So that was more than enough and now we're very much legal. Uh, still requires a permit, but it doesn't require escort. And uh, things are good. So we're strapping down everything else on the back of the truck. We'll have blades, we'll have the spare engine, a couple of boxes, and then we'll be good to go. Uh, of course, a little bit of uh, tarping too. We'll put tarps around the front of the aircraft and around the spare engine. Beyond that, it's a pretty straightforward process. So we wish them the best of luck with it. We know they're going to be restoring it and eventually it will find itself on the deck of the USS Iowa. It will go first to a hangar in Torrance where one of our uh, the friends of the ship has a, a, an airplane hangar. And uh, once it's stored there, we'll start to work with local folks there to figure out the restoration process. This will probably take at least a year. Uh, rather aggressive to get it up and running by next summer, but it might happen. Uh, but we, we certainly have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of pieces and parts. It's a big puzzle. The good news is that the aircraft is virtually complete. It's a pretty extraordinary example of a 1950s rotary wing aircraft, pretty much all together. I'd say 90 to 95 percent complete. I claim a little bit of connection with the USS Iowa since I was born in Iowa.